All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sharon Roberts, and I come to you from New Orleans. Um, I teach um, digital media, converge media, and a broad range of mass communication courses, as well as Latin American and Caribbean courses at Xavier, which is a historically black university um, in the city. And um, I'm interested in understanding how digital media is transforming the work of journalism in the Caribbean and circum circum-Caribbean countries, particularly countries that are going through political and social change. And so I want to share with you a little bit of insights from some 2017 um, field research in Cuba um, to see how things are um, similar and different to different places. I've primarily done some research um, with journalists in Haiti. Um, and so I wanted to see how things were also changing for journalism in Cuba. Um, so I wanted to see how journalists under the age of 28 were being impacted by digital media. And in, in the case of Cuba, um, this is something that started after 2007 um, and then really took off um, after 2010 with these main um, 14 blogs. Currently, there are 25 non-state um, media blogs. Um, and then 75 more and another 200 um, government approved blogs um, run by Cubans. And in this case, the blogs that you see behind me, the main leading Cuban non-state blogs have all been censored at different points in time. Um, their audiences are primarily not in Cuba. So what does that mean for the type of work that they're covering for changing um, social and political um, issues and factors facing Cubans? if their content is not able to be accessed and reached by most Cubans. Um, so I wanted to see how 35 journalists from nine different organizations who work for independent and state media and who are young journalists still in Cuba are using digital media, having been influenced by these 14 more prominent sites to address some of the issues that are facing a change in Cuba. Um, one of the main things that is inspiring um, why I think this is important and why it matters is primarily because most Cubans don't have access to the internet. Most of them will access content through some type of mobile device. Um, the cost of using El Paquete um, is five cooks um, and the average um, salary is 25 cooks. So you're looking at economic barriers for people who are in, in Cuba to be able to access digital content that they may not be able to get from state-controlled media or media that self-censors itself in Cuba. Um, so, and then most of the sites that are the most prominent sites do not focus on the experiences and lives and issues of people outside of Havana. So what does that mean for those young journalists who want to engage with digital media and they are based in Cuba and they are working um, for state media or independent um, um, approved media that self-censor? Self so this is the group of journalists that I studied while I was there. Um, and so it's important to note that even though Cuba is in an authoritarian um, state, that there is challenges to the status quo that exist in traditional media. Um, that's one study by Santa Maria in 2017 that outlines that, um, and that the Cuban state tolerates this type of um, checks on different issues that are facing Cubans. Another thing to understand is that even though Cuba um, is unique from the rest of the region in the sense that it had a Cuban revolution and it provides for addressing issues of inequality, um, because there is more neoliberal practices in place, certain people get access to more remittances than others. Um, and because of this, there is a new growing economic apartheid, which also impacts who gets access to information and whose issues are addressed. And so this brings it closer to the cases of other places um, in terms of the need to address inequalities and what the role of the media is in these particular spaces. And I liken this a lot to Haiti under the dictatorship where there was a new media in place under an authoritarian rule and that new media was radio. Um, and it was journalists in Haiti who were able to mix an old and new um, to be able to advocate for different changes to improve the quality and well-being and to address 
human rights in Haiti. And I, I have this framework in mind in understanding how journalists are mixing the old and new when looking at Cuba. Okay, so what did these journalists sort of share? Um, the, most of the prominent blogs, those bloggers take positions or sides that could be pro-state or anti-state. But these young journalists have identified that even though they work for state organizations, state media organizations, they aspire to be neutral. They aspire to have work that is balanced, and they, they aspire to look for truths. And truths may put them more in line with a state policy, or it may put them against. And they don't want to um, develop careers um, like the more prominent blogs that actually put them on one side or the other side. So their understanding of objectivity is something that holds, despite the fact that they have grown up as teenagers and then entered a career into journalism under these more prominent um, Cuban blogs. Um, they see that part of the work is also that addressing social issues is part of continuing the revolution. And then they see their revolution in phases that continues to move beyond the Cuban revolution and that, goes, that started before the Cuban revolution. In sort of identifying things that are um, important to their understanding of how they should address the issues that are facing change in Cuba, they see that we don't want to turn into um, another one of their neighbors in which there is more inequalities that are brought about by dismantling things that have been put in place for years as a result of the revolution. Um, and that even though that they're moving to more neoliberal practices, they don't want that to necessarily change the benefits that have come out, but they still want to have more freedoms um, that will help their country advance and develop. And primarily, the main freedom that they think that they should agitate for in their journalism is the, um, to have a free vote, right? So, um, and looking at 2017 um, digital content that they provided um, for this study, most of them used blogs that they used either anonymously or they contributed to other blogs to post and write journalism about topics that they couldn't speak about directly in their state media jobs, right? And then secondly, they would use social media as a way to um, share information that they couldn't cover directly in their state media jobs, followed by um, um, PDFs as well as um, um, emails to disseminate their content. And the primary reason for this is if you aren't one of the major 25 blogs, you have to spend money to be able to disseminate your content offline through El Paquete. And since there's, there's an economic barrier to doing so, social media is very useful for them to be able to disseminate without having to pay to go through El Paquete. Um, another finding that came out of this study is that the primary topic that they're able to address more directly digitally that they cannot do in their traditional jobs is the issue of politics. Then they can look at cultural issues, race being the primary topic, um, that they discuss race and other sorts of um, class and other parts of the Cuban culture that could be, um, that's up for discussion in a change in Cuba, followed by other issues that you can see over here. And then lastly, in terms of which digital platforms work for different types of topics, for posting to blogs, politics remains the primary topic. For PDF, um, work that's shared over PDF, um, culture. For social media, there's an equal split between um, politics, culture, and education. And then lastly, um, through emails, issues about welfare of ordinary Cubans, how they manage to live their um, ordinary lives, and the experiences of living on a budget of 25 CUCs are all issues that show up in, their, um, in, in which platforms they choose to share their content. Um, and so lastly, I just want to thank um, the participants and my institution and Tulane University for allowing me to travel to Cuba and also to the journal editor, Amy um, Weiss, and the um, other two editors for this issue. Thank you.